Hello, everybody, and here we go. Welcome to Pedo Vision. Thank you. Yes. Uh, all right. Good. So, um, uh, by the way, Naranda, you noticed the official Naranda search box at the top right? We did. Yes, just for Although you. Although I did search for office hours, and I found nothing. <laughs> all right. Submit a bug report. Okay. Smart advance. <laughs> okay. So um, who did not complete the TDD um, uh, test-driven development homework? Everybody got, got it done? Uh, huh? You did. It's, it's done, but I just need to kind of like comment on stuff. My, okay. my laptop died on me. Well, we, we try to achieve perfection, don't we? Oh, we just assigned the grades. Yes. Oh, the maze. Okay, well, um, I you know, I think some of you haven't done it at all yet, and you have to, sort of a, a tactical homework decision to make, which is, do you keep on trying to do something versus keep up with what's going on? And, uh, you know, it's a balancing act because, I mean, the purpose of the maze was not to figure out that you were new about mazes. The purpose was to give you practice with Ruby. So you have to decide individually what you want to do. I mean, when homework is a week late, you know, you're not going to get a super high grade for it, clearly. Um, so ask yourself whether it's better to keep moving or catch up with your own homework. Okay? Um, I mean, certainly everybody in class should be very, very comfortable with Ruby at this point. If you're not, then, you know, I'm probably talking to you, and if I'm not talking to you, then come talk to me, because that's fundamental. Okay? Um, but so some of you didn't finish it. Um, how did this, so those of you who finished it, how did it feel doing test-driven development? What does it mean to you? And I'm going to pick on people that don't usually put their hands up. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I thought it was actually pretty, pretty nice to actually kind of be made to do it, because yep. otherwise I wouldn't do it. Yeah. And I think that I could maybe go back and make my testing program for assignment three better and yeah. it could help me yeah. the, the, solve and, some of the problems. Yeah. Who else? Some comment on what it was like to, to do TDD? Yes. It was kind of weird to have to come up with the tests before writing any code. Pause. Did everybody do that? Did everybody actually write the tests first? Yeah. Who did not uh, write the tests first? Okay. <laughs> okay. And why is it, you know, tell me, talk about the trade-off, as you can imagine it, between writing it first and not writing it first. What, what do you think happens? Well, it definitely makes sense from a test-driven development motivated standpoint. Yeah. You're writing tests, like, and designing your code to pass the test. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But it kind of forced me to think about my code in a very different way. Yeah. Because I, I, especially with Ruby, I think it's easier to do this, I like to, uh, Start simple yeah. and build things up. Yeah. And a simple thing can pass a simple test, but if I just write a, a, a class for a shape that doesn't necessarily do anything, it yeah. just initializes and spits out some basic output that I can just visually see. Yeah. A lot, that's a lot of time I kind of think iteratively like yeah. that. And with a test, all I see is that it's failing the test repeatedly. Right, right. Things like that. Yeah. I was actually kind of surprised because I assumed I was not going to like it, yep. um, and I don't know that I'm automatically going to do this every single time, but I feel like I should. But yep. from an object-oriented point of view, yep. it made sense to abstract away from the actual writing of code, just be like, if I tell to do this, it should return this. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of like yep. that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I thought it was interesting to get away from like how to do it instead of like I want this data. Yeah. And not like oh, how am I going to actually build it? Then decide, try to meet the expectations of what you want. Yeah. That took. Well, um, I have to go to bed. Um, Had you done it before? Sorry. Had you done it before? Yeah. TDD? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you're much more focused on, um, uh, what's it called? Like, public and private uh, yeah. distinctions because you can only test what is like public or protected. Yeah. And so uh, you, you really think of making not, not too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whenever you like refactor or doing like helper methods or stuff, yeah. then you really care about making them private or yeah. testing the test. Like yeah, yeah. Did anybody discover a bug that didn't? I know there's a bug that a lot of you have, by the way. Did anybody discover a bug through testing that they didn't realize was there? Did you? No? Anybody? No? Uh, well, how would you test removing an object from a scene? A shape from the scene. How would you test that? Say a test. Yeah, William. Um, 
this is why I you know like doing it is that I will find a way to compare uh, shapes. Uh huh. So I will uh, I'll just compare that to make sure that those two shapes have the same coordinates, same two sets of coordinates. Yeah. Okay. Wait. No, not you guys. Um. How about um. How about you? How would, how would you test? I mean, just imagine. Forget about the code. How do you, what's the one way to test? I want to test this function that method of remove the shape from the scene. How would you test? Well, we also had a thing to count the amount of shapes in the scene. Right. So you could test if that was what I want. Okay, that's one way. Anybody see a humongous hole in that test? Like a, I could drive a truck through it? Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> now they're We had a method to count the amount of shapes in the scene, so we could test if the amount of shapes and if that's not let you, I'll let, since I insulted you, I'll let you add to it. And, and what if that's not enough? What bug would that let go through? Well, if I had a mistake in that method, right? Well, if it deletes the wrong shape. Oh, and uh, yeah. A lot of people have that bug. You didn't say that the method deleted a specific shape. Well, it deleted that shape. Oh, it deleted a specific shape, right? No, I didn't say that. No, it deleted a specific shape. It did not. But deleting a random shape? It was the common sense. Feel that I expect you guys to apply as well. I didn't like you. Like the first shape you put in. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh wait, not you. Not you. Not you. Yeah. How about you? How do we go? Yeah, I guess I didn't actually test to see if when I deleted the shape, the right one deleted. Yeah. So I guess that would be a good idea to check for that. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. How about trying to delete the same one twice to make sure that's the right one? That's another one. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know how everyone else implemented, but I implemented it off of just the array. So I assumed that. Uh, array function for delete yeah. was the was good enough, and that theirs wasn't going to be broken. Well, so I didn't I mean, check if it actually. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Pause, because when I saw your, it must have been yours. I don't remember because I was going through them very fast. I didn't know that array had a delete. Um, oh, you didn't. You didn't. It, yeah. it has a delete. Right? It, it has a delete. Goes through and it'll find the object and it finds the first and, instance yeah. of that object. If it's a custom it. object, it also gets paired with its memory location, so you know it's the same. Yeah, so so that was excellent. So, but did, when I saw it, what, so you said you didn't know. What I did is I read the doc for the uh, array delete, and then I wrote a little, you know, in Pry, I wrote a little test program to make sure that it did what I thought it did, and it did. So, so yeah, you can definitely assume that array delete does what it says it's going to do, as long as you know for sure that you understand what it's supposed to do. Uh, and there are definitely nuances like equality tests. You know, uh, you can have, you know, is the string uh, uh, quote ABC equal 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 to quote ABC. Is it dot EQ of quote ABC? There's all these interesting uh, k. And there's even a triple equals uh, that also comes into play. Yes, William. Yeah. So the array delete method will it delete two <laughs> class if instances? If you have two of the same one, it deletes all of them. But no, they would have to be the same memory location, so they have to exactly yeah, actually be the same. Memory. So if you create two different objects. Yeah. So if you had like two circles, it would only delete the circle. You no, but you, you're not necessarily referring to the exact one. So, for example, if you create okay. a second, yeah, yeah. some center, some radius. Like, and then a separate it section, the code, create another cycle. That's, that's a different shape. Yeah, not really right. delete that. It would, it would consider it a different one because there are different memory locations. Yeah. It's interesting. So, yeah, but but these are some arcane issues that you would want to check on in your test if you weren't 100% sure about what it did. Yeah. Okay? So, anyway, so, so I mean, I think for me, so I'm going to give you the, the, the religious. Um, sort of the official orthodox way of doing testing, and I'm going to tell you what I actually do. Um, I find many times that I do write tests first, but I don't do it uh, dogmatically. And certainly, you write tests, and you'll see when I do it, I'm going to do a slow demo to sort of talk about these issues again, even though many of you have taught it. Um, uh, you will see that it's very, very useful to write code or write a test, write code. Test a couple of more methods, write some more code. So I definitely don't test the whole class in its full glory. Another really um, useful thing that testing, do, that, that test-driven design does, is it forces you into the mindset of the client of your code, even though it may be you. It forces you to think not about how it's going to be implemented, but how I want to use it. And that's a very useful way to think because if you start with the implementation, it's going to force you to, uh, or you, you will have a tendency to develop. The architecture of your of your objects in a way that is not necessarily convenient to the overall system. You're going to be focused on the in innards. Um, so anyway, so so we'll dig into that a little bit more. 
A uh, couple of conventions that I saw a few of you not follow, which is totally understandable because this is a, a homework, so I'm not dinging you on it. I just want to let you know um, that uh, uh, universally, just about uh, the tests are separate from the from the, from the actual code, uh, and they're called you know class underscore test dot rb or class underscore spec dot rb if you're using R spec, uh, and generally they're kept in a separate directory as well. But don't worry about that. Who can say a really good reason to keep the test separate from the code? Yeah? Every time you run the file, if you don't keep it separate, it runs tests. Uh, that's one, that's, yeah, that's basically it. I mean, there's a, there's a more general way of saying that, but yes. Uh, so, hmm. If you put it in production, upload on the server, you just don't upload the test. Right. You don't test it, no server keeps the file on the server. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, exactly, yes. Well, I think it's pretty minor. Yeah. That's not how the client is going to be using it. So if there's some other issue, right? That's a, no, no, that, that's that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, to the extent because this is classic. I mean, have ever heard of this phrase? Phrase a Heisen bug. Anybody heard the Heisen bug? It has nothing to do with Breaking Bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, only like in a very meta way. Who can explain or who can guess what a Heisen bug is? A Heisen bug in your code is. But that disappears whenever you turn on the test that you do the bug. Who's ever seen one of those? Yeah, you have to. If you if you do any serious coding, you you've done, you've seen that. Everything works perfectly in the test. You turn the test on and it disappears. Yes. But is that a question or me? Or were you just? No, saying? I actually wanted to remember that. Have you heard of Heisenberg as the as the way to describe it? No, no, not the term, but I think uh, after you described it, I remember that it was very funny. It was a, a two string method in Java, mm -hmm. which um, uh, gives a string. Yeah. And that two string method actually changed to set some, some instance variables. Right. right. So when you were debugging it, yeah. um, and the debugger showed the string representation of the object, so yeah. it was calling it, yeah. and was running on fine, but when you were just running it without the test, yeah. then nobody called the two string method. Ah, and yeah. And everything broke. Yeah, and everything broke. Classic. Classic. Absolutely. OK. Great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about testing in, in sort of much more general sense, OK? So um, there are a bunch of different categories of testing, and there's a lot of terminology that flies around. In general, the purpose of testing, obviously, is to assure the quality of your code. Now, one, one, one way I know a developer or a computer science person is naive, green, and unexperienced is when they tell me, I fit, just fixed the last bug. Because you know there is no such thing. It's kind of a strange, uh, kind of a, in the limit, there's always another bug. So you never fix the last bug. You only fix the last bug you know about. So testing's purpose is obviously to uh, discover and kill bugs before they go into production. Now, um, the, the trade-off with testing that people always think about, of course, is the effort. Because in a way, um, the test, the code for the test, is, is a mirror image of the code being tested. So in a way, it feels like you're writing the same stuff twice. You have to write the point and the square and the rectangle, whatever, then you're going to write the test for them. And they often shadow each other. So there's definitely a cost to writing tests. And there's lots of debates and studies and research that's done to find out exactly what the payoff is for different kinds of tests. Because it's also very easy to become uh, so obsessed with testing that you test the same code multiple times. One concept that people throw around, uh, which is legitimate, is this notion of test coverage. Now, if you have a really big system with thousands of classes and tens of thousands of methods, and you have lots and lots of tests, and a real production system can literally have multiple thousands of tests that they run regularly to test all this stuff. Test coverage is the concept that uh, if you imagine a, a large program as a, a, a large number of code paths with conditionals, let's say you might go here, you might go there, you might go here three times, and you imagine a test running through all your code and painting all the lines of code that are run as part of the test, painting them red, at the end of running all your tests, how many of your lines of code are read? It's very easy to write tests, especially for error handling, which is often the most difficult part, and for error recovery and so on, that don't test those paths. And so there are tools developed in, in every language uh, called test coverage tools, which you turn on, and you run your tests, and then it says, OK, you've covered 29% you know, of your code. And people look at that. Uh, sometimes they look at them as management tools to make sure that the, that the engineering team is doing a good job. Sometimes they look at it as, 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 uh, as 
quality engineering tools to make sure that the testing happens. So there's the notion of test coverage. Okay. Now the other the other notions are uh, related to testing is uh, another concept you might hear are called is black box versus white box testing. Okay. Now I'm just telling you these terms so you've heard them and have an idea because I think it will apply also to the way you think about writing your own tests. Okay. Black box testing is when the tests treat the code being tested as a black box, meaning they don't know anything and they don't care anything about how the code is implemented, what the data structures are, anything like that. They just poke at it and see that it does the right thing, black box testing. Very legitimate because you don't want to be biased uh, <coughs> by the fact that you know that this particular thing is um, you know, storing all its data structures in memory, that you don't have to worry about testing anything relating to this or something like that. So black box testing is one kind. Another kind of testing is white box testing, which is the opposite, where you start from reading the source code and visually identifying by your own brain what the parts of the code are that are, that, that are likely to have bugs and write tests to test those particular things. So black box versus white box testing. Uh, in the case when the engineer, you guys, is writing the test themselves, obviously um, uh, it will qualify as, as white box testing because you know what's in there. All right, But you can still sort of um, you play mind game with yourself and, you know, pretend or forget about what you know about the way the thing is implemented and, and write the tests. So those are some of the, the dimensions of testing. Now, the, 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 one of the most significant ones for me is unit testing versus the other kinds. Okay, you have unit testing, you have integration testing, you have performance testing. Well, I have a list here. End-to-end uh, -end testing, code coverage, we talked about that, performance testing. Start with unit testing. Unit testing is what you did for this homework. Unit testing takes one object, preferably one object by itself, sometimes one or two objects together. Usually the objects are not connected to the outside world in a significant way or at all, and you test it. It's a, it's a, it's a, the word unit just means you know, one, one module, one program. As soon as you go up from unit testing, and by the way, all these terms, you know, you can dissect them, you know, you test an object, you test a family of classes, but it's a small thing, small thing with a, with a well-defined, well-understandable um, expected behavior. The next level up is integration testing. Integration, and this by the way, okay, so it, it is a continuum. Integration testing is when you put a bunch of things together, and it's at a higher level. Um, uh, you might, for example, test, um, uh, uh, let me think, that, that the trade assistant might do integration testing with, you know, leave the UI out, but make sure that we can, you're able to run uh, stock price, uh, 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 the, the grabbing of the stock prices and applying rules to them and generating notifications, that's, that subsystem integrates together and works. Okay, or it may just be the, the subsystem that grabs stock prices because in there there'll be multiple classes that can test it individually. And then there's end-to-end -end testing. End-to-end -end testing is where I built a whole site and, or a whole app and I essentially fired up and simulate somebody pushing the login button. And then make sure that all the pieces that are involved, which would be taking the information in, the password in, validating it, submitting it to the, to the thing that checks the validity of the password, realizing that the, the, the login worked, making sure that the, that the count of number of login users goes up, making sure that the, uh, the, the disk record of the, of the audit log of the login worked, making sure in turn that the user receives back a screen that has the last login information all the way up to uh, completion. That would be end-to-end end -end testing. You just literally run the whole system to do its whole task. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that as well. End-to-end um, -end means clearly that potentially all the bits of the system are in play, but it's not necessarily concerned about covering every particular uh, iteration. And you'll find people use the term smoke test. A smoke test is when you just finish building your robot and you plug it in the wall the first time and you see whether it smokes. Okay? And that, that's legitimate. It's like, it's like, does it work at all? And that's a very short test where you just basically maybe say, pretend to be a web browser and do a get on the home page and make sure that you get a home page back. So, okay, the thing basically is alive. That's a smoke test. It's a, it's a kind of end to end test but it tends to be much shorter. Okay, uh, and then there's performance testing, which is, you know, uh, yes? Is it 
Yes. Because I found that when I was writing my tests, I had to use the same code blocks over and over again to create objects. Right. And run the same. Yeah, uh, the same principles apply. It's, it's also a bad idea to, to duplicate yourself for, for all the same reasons, but there's slightly different techniques for avoiding that, and I'll show you some of those today. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the rules, the, the, not the, the rules, but the, 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 so the, the stylistic guidance is, is exactly the same, and for the same reasons. Uh, the reasons are, you know, if you repeat the code and you find a bug in the code, you repeat it, you have to go fix it everywhere. That's one. Number two, um, you have to reinvent the wheel because you have to go find the place where you did something once and do it again. Uh, and number three, it just shows bad craftsmanship. <laughs> okay. So, um, right. Let's, so let's do some TDD. So, I'm going to do it the dumb way first, as you can see in my example. I'm going to move this over and out of my way. I'm going to run my editor. And I'm going to fit it to the window. Kill this. Kill this. Ah, oh, great. I'll show this. Okay. Okay. All right. So the, the, the way I like to explain it or think about this is to think about how each of you probably did your testing when you first. Uh, wrote the uh, PA1, PA2, or PA3, which is, I'm going to just copy this from here, and imagine that my job was to write a, f a very simplistic factorial uh, program. I'm going to go to my my dev, I'm going to create directory, demo, factorial.rb. Of course, copy and paste didn't do what I wanted, so just, to, I'm sure this is like COSI 101, a little recursive program to write, ah, a factorial. Do you know how to do it? Because I don't. Okay, well, I'm done already. So here I have my factorial program. Uh, and I called it RB so I can run it. And I get an error. Ah, uh, gosh, great. Um, pardon? Ends. I mean, your condition of the end is. That doesn't matter. No, no, it's something else. It's something annoying. Uh, I think I have to change my build system to be Ruby. Better. Okay, so, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, does this work or not? Well, I don't know. I can do fact one, put s fact, fact of one, put s fact of two. And I can see, okay, that's what I, that's maybe what I expect, maybe not. Do another one and do it like this, the old-fashioned way. Type them one at a time. Um, or I can try zero. And I see that. Uh, yes, it crashes. Okay, well, that's a bug, right? So, so the simplistic thing to do is, okay, this is a pain, but I have to look at the screen. So the next thing I'm going to do is going to say, okay, if facts of one is not equal. Yes. Can you make it slightly bigger? Yes. How's that? If fact of one of one, let me do it like this, uh, not equal to one, put s error. I'll do it like this. Put s error. Else if fact of two is not equal to two, then put s error. Else if we'll get to it. Else if fact of zero not equal to what it should be, I don't know. One. Okay. Then put S error. I need a thing here. And 
and uh, I get this error, and like nothing good happens, so I don't even know what happened. So I'm going to take this out. No, no, I know why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant I was I was playing the role of I don't know what happened. Move it. So and then I say, well, these error messages are not very good. It's very very time consuming. But that's basically the technique. The basic idea is, you know, I wrote a program and I, I use my imagination to to what the inputs and outputs should be, and then I write error messages to indicate something about the error, and that becomes very quickly very time consuming and very annoying. So um, so what happened was people saw this. And they said, what kind of tools can we build to automate this? And uh, they liked testing so much in the Ruby world that they built several different tools. Uh, and the three important ones that exist are um, RSpec, Minitest, and Minitest Spec. And they are syntactically different enough probably to, to confuse the hell out of you, but conceptually they're practically the same. Um, I'm using Minitest Spec because I was using RSpec before, and I wanted to learn many test specs, so I used this as an excuse to do it. Uh, I suggest you do it too, because that's the one I'm going to be using in examples. But really, if you fall in love with any of the other ones, that's fine as well. But they all have the same basic structure. Okay, the basic structure is you have a, you have a, a and I won't talk about syntax. You're able to declare some setup procedure of some kind to sort of create some initial uh, um, instances of, of objects that you need. And then you can write a series of tests, and each test takes one of those, you know, does something, and then checks the expected result to make sure it matches that. And the purpose of the syntax uh, of the structure is to give you an abstraction, basically, for a collection of tests that you can then that you can then run. Okay. Um, so there's the, the collection of tests, sometimes called the test suite. Each individual test has a name and does a test, and there's some setup. That's the sort of the basic framework they all have. Some principles uh, in this world uh, are, uh, in addition to the ones I said before, which is uh, you know one test file per source file, is one test per test one thing. I have one assertion per test case. So don't do you know um, you know a must be equal must must equal five. Do some more steps, then say B must equal three, then some more steps, and then C must equal four. The reason is that as soon as the test fails, one of those must equals fails, that whole test case is thrown out the window. So the other tests do not get tested. If you make them granular, one assertion or one assumption or one um, uh, must be or shouldn't be per test case, then you will get uh, the errors will be ca will be will be um, caught, reported, but the thing goes on. So one princi principle number one is uh, one assertion per test case. Principle number two is, was that a hand? OK. Principle number two is um, you cannot have any dependency on the order in which the test cases are run. You can't set something up in test case one and then assume that that state is true in test case two. Why? Well, because it's a bad idea. But more, more, moreover, the test running framework will actually scramble your tests and run them in any order. And so you, if you try to depend on the order, you're going to have trouble. Everybody with me? Yes? OK. OK. So now let's go try doing this. And we're now going to have George help me with the deleting of the column. Ah. OK, go. Control shift down? Wait. Control option. Control shift. Uh, I don't think so. Why did you check the menu? I just control alt and then down or Control, option, and now what? No. It's a Mac, you know, so everything's different. Wait, this is the wrong one anyway. What the heck did I do here? Pardon? 
Really? Oh, man. So the option shift? Nope. What's that? Oh, you're a Vim person? Okay. I, I should have known. <laughs> I don't know. So we have the same factorial again. We have the require on top. And now we start with it. See, I do the same thing I said it's not good for demo purposes. Uh, I'm using mini test slash auto run. Oddly enough, is how you get mini test spec. I don't know why. Um, okay. And the describe block is the collection of tests uh, or a test suite. Um, you notice that I use a quoted factorials there instead of a class name. So the class name is there only for documentation purposes. So you could say describe you know, point or something, uh, put it here in, instead of in quotes, you could put it here in capital, like the class name, which of course I don't have here, but you can do a, you can do a string as well. Now, in addition, I don't have a setup section here, but we see, let me just pull this down. So we see here described, so this basically is the test block, the, te the test unit, each it block is an individual test, each test has only one must something or shouldn't something. This string here works for one, works for two, is just documentation. Um, and if I delete this, which I just, well, let me just run it first. I just ran it and let's study what we get back here. So we get a letter E, which means one of the tests failed. Oh, by the way, it says here, this seed, this number means it's randomizing. So it's showing one letter for every test uh, assertion that is that is run, a dot for when it worked, a letter for when it failed. Then it says how many it did. It did um, uh, somewhere. Oh yeah, here it did four tests, which included three assertions and one error. So if we look at this, we see one, two, three, four, four tests, three assertions that worked and one that failed. Gotcha. Notice also that if I look further, I get very nice error messages. For example, it does not kick my Ruby uh, run and kill it. It just catches the stack level too deep and tells me the line on which it failed, line four. Uh, and, um, and that's it, right? So I now know where the bug is and I can go in here and change this. And um, let's say, uh, what? That's, okay, that's interesting. Run it, and um, this, so this is incorrect. So we'll fix this. Now, how did I get this number? Very normal technique. There's nothing. There's nothing evil about this. I just put a random number in there. I ran the test, and I got what it actually produced. <laughs> and that's how I got that number. Uh, I mean, I did a small mental check to see whether it was approximately right. And that's how I got that number. So you guys probably could have done that as well with your areas. That's very normal. It's good to have a little bit of, you know, keep your brain engaged to think about whether that's the right number. But what if it's strong? What, yeah, you're right. What if, it, if it's a very important thing, if it's like the amount, number of bitcoins in your account, then I would probably check it with the, with what? With the calculator, if you trust that anymore. <laughs> what? I should hope that you calculate Well, it might be invaded by the NSA. Okay. So, um, so that, those, that, that's it, basically. That's the basic principle, OK? Now, the other principle is, what else can, what, to, the, not the TDD uh, perspective is, like what else can we test to make sure this factorial works correctly? What other, I mean, you think about, you're not going to put every number in. That's stupid. But you're going to think about representative numbers that might exercise it. So we have, we have 1, we have 2, we have 0, we have 20. Yeah, let's try another. Well, first. Since this is TDD, who's the mathematician here? What's the correct answer to factorial of minus 10? Pardon? Should be an error? OK. So OK. So factorial of minus 10. Now we go to our. I know. We're going we're gonna to have the bug first, and then we're going to fix it. 
uh, gosh, well, I'm going to just use Google, uh, mini test spec uh, uh, cheat sheet. Oh, this is not a good one. Oh, wait. Must, 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 must raise. Must raise. Oh, you have to specify the error. Okay, good. That's cool. So I'm going to do factorial it. Must handle negatives correctly. Do. Don't forget the do. Okay. And the syntax is... Thank you. Proc, curly bracket, close, dot, must, raise, runtime error. Let's just make that up. And don't forget the end. And run it. And let's see what we got. See, this is test-driven development. I don't, I don't know yet how to make that happen. I don't even know about it. It expected a runtime error, but nothing was raised. Oh, OK, excellent. So obviously, we have to change this. We have to say if. If n is less than 0, then fail. Else if n is, well, that's fine, because we, we covered it there. I don't like indentations that are not neat, so I have to neaten this up. And run it again. Boom, it worked. So now we're in business. Now we sort of found a bug by coming up with a new test got a failing test, corrected it. Now we got all, people talk about red, green, refactor, red, green, refactor. That's the TDD way of being a software engineer. Red, if you turn on certain options, the dots become red dots, or the E's become red E's. And the idea is that you write a bunch of tests, they fail, you fix the tests until you get all green, and then everything's working. And then if you need to, you go clean up your code, you refactor. Why is it a good idea to refactor after you have green? Wen Bing, why is it a good idea to refactor when you have all greens? What, did you understand the question? Why, why is it important to wait until you have all green on your tests before you refactor? Hmm. Uh, how about... Um, Mm, Jacob. Okay. Uh, William. This is to make sure that your code does what it does, basically, for you. Yeah, close, pretty close, but importantly. Anybody else? Uh, how about um, Eddie? No? Yes? all works, then you know it all works, you can save it as like a state that you can later go back to once you play around with it. Yep, yep. Anybody else? Yes, George. I think we're making a find that's not changing the code without changing the functionality. Yep. And yeah. uh, by making sure that all your tests are running, you can uh, at least have having to have an assumption that you have a state where you can go and run the problem to the picture and play around with it. It's like a safety net. So you create the safety net, you make sure the safety net is intact, and then you start changing the parts. And you know that if you break something, you'll find out. If you start changing the parts before you have all your tests running successfully, well, if you break something, you won't know because the tests were failing anyway. So generally, you, you, if you're ner and it's very true, it's a real phenomenon, that if you're coding on a big system as you guys are going to be coding, and uh, you have to do some major changes, either cha refactoring or adding a feature, it can be kind of scary because it was working yesterday. I have to hand it in tomorrow. How do I know I won't break it? Well, if you have a good set of tests, it gives you confidence. It's a confidence-building measure, and it becomes your safety net when you're refactoring. OK. Yes. Yes. Say what? With what? If it's not an integer. Ah, very good. That's the right way to think about this stuff. So it, huh? Yeah, exactly. Not accept non-integers. Especially important in a language like Ruby because there's no ch type checking in this situation. So I could do, uh, well, what do we want it to do if it's non-integer? Throw an error? 
Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. And I won't go through the whole exercise. You get the idea. Because then you might say it has to be a different error and go on and so on and so forth. Judgment comes into play, right? You have to have the judgment as to what is, it, what is enough, what is too much testing. All right? But I'll tell you, whenever, especially when you're building a, a, an algorithm with a bunch of like, you know, off by one error possibilities or complicated logic or complicated structure, um, writing the test is really a winner. You will discover, I've discovered so many bugs that I had no idea existed. And you put a little bit of code that does something smart in the middle of a very big system. And then you click on the page and instead of saying, you know, three cigarettes, it says seven cigarettes or e-cigarettes. You know, where do you start to find out where that bug is? Well, if you had tested every little bit by itself, the algorithm that computed how many how many e-cigarettes you had would be up on the on the on the bench by itself, and it, it would be a huge it can be a huge time saver. Okay. Simple solution. Yes, sir. Is it always it? Ah, um, in in let's say yes. <laughs> Uh, if, if you're using Minitest by itself, then it's, there's a slightly different syntax where you have to uh, it, type more and come up with names for tests. This, the, the advantage here is you can put it in a sentence, and when it fails, let's make it fail, you get a, a useful error message. Test 4 works for 0 factorials, so it's on factorials. It must work for 0, so boom, there it is. You can find it. So if the error message is, is corresponding to the problem. It says what's actual, what's, what's uh, so it is always it, is the answer. By the way, notice, this is not a special language. This is just Ruby. This is some fancy Ruby metaprogramming, OK? Uh, it is a method that takes a parameter and a block. This is the block parameter to it. Fact is your method. Must equal is being caught. How would that work? How come the fact? method which returns an integer, how come it has a must equal method on it? I mean, can anybody guess? This doesn't make any sense. This method here returns an integer, or 0, or throws an error. And then I'm calling a method on it called must equal. How does that work? Any guesses? Yes. Yes, and? It's a, it's a start. Integers are objects, and? Huh? Yeah, some kind of inheritance, yeah. The, the method must equal is uh, some method of object or something like that. It could be on object, it could be on, on in, integer or anything like that, yes. Frame of beginning? Yeah. There's this concept in, in, in Ruby which we saw like in the first day, but it, you probably thought it was just a, a cute trick, not really worth anything. Where you could reopen a class, I could do class point, put some methods, say n and then do a little bit later, do class point again, and put some more method. That's called reopening the class point. But you can do the same thing with, with, um, with built-in classes. So you could do class boolean or class uh, string and add a method to it. And so this test harness, when you do include the thing at the top, include many test slash uh, auto run, is actually adding some methods to the built-in classes. Yes? Well, everything is a, is a um, remember the must equal, you know that we're talking about a certain set of, uh, it's, it's, well, you can do a must equal an object as well. So probably it's attaching it not to a built-in class, but to object, to the topmost built-in class that everything inherits from. So they reopen, quote unquote, the class object, and they add a method must equal to it, something like that. This is some of the most delicate, complicated, yeah, conceptually complicated code to write. So these test frameworks, while they're not huge pieces of code, they're some really strange looking code because they do this magic. They put the, the work is done by the developer so that the, the people writing the test don't have to work as hard. OK? All right, let's go to another example. Whew. Well, maybe I'm not going to do it that way because obviously time is ticking away. Uh, so I was going to do this example, but I won't. So I had a, um, there's another example here, which is go to it on your computers. Um, it's a class representing playing cards. And um, basically, the exercise was going to be, um, 
Let's do it. Why the hell? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is that true? I don't know if that's true. Did everybody look at this and do this? That's, yeah, because there's, there's key bindings that are messing me up. Uh, so basically, this is a simple class that represents a, a set of cards. And what I want to do is have us think about other tests we can add to this. To again, drive home the point about discovering behaviors that we don't know about yet. God. I gotta have to look up this uh, command for future reference. Well, I have to. What happens is that I have to. I have some key association that I have to disable. I think on the Mac. That's what you have to do. Yeah. Which is really useless anyway. I guess. <laughs> but look at this. Just a little construct that you guys may not know. Check it out. Who can explain what that does while I type? It turns all of those into an array of strings where each one of those words becomes a string in the array block. Yes, and then what does the method do? Okay. Uh, Joe, did you know? Did you understand what that is? The number to English. Not really. Can you tell us? Look at it now and tell us. What do you think it does? I can't really read it. Oh, you should come sit where you can read it. Yeah. Huh? What? No, I mean, I understand. So what, what is the percent W? That's the okay, that's the interesting construct. Okay. I, I understand, after hearing Alex explain it, I understand how it works and why there's fail, zero, fail, one, because these are not it's just, cards. It looks like it's just kind of using it from a string as a placeholder to say, like, the values of the amount of failures in the test maps. No, 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 no. No, this is turning a number into the English translation. It's just using it. Front front yeah, it's a shortcut for... You did not talk the same zero for you one day, right? Huh? You did not talk that stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Who who wants to refute that? I don't have to have the zero and the one there. You want to refute yourself? Okay, go for it. Because you could have value minus two or something. <laughs> huh? Index. What's that? You could have value minus two. Yeah, you could have. That's true. That's another way to do it. But um, you know, I don't know if it's better or worse, but it's different. Um, so Joe. Yeah. So percent W parentheses close parenthesis, constructs an array of strings, mm -hmm. an array of strings where the strings are all the words that are separated by white space between the Correct. parentheses. Creates an array of strings, mm -hmm. and then this here it indexes into the array by the parameter of the method, mm -hmm. and so returns. What is the parameter of the method? Let's say if it's three, what will it return? It will return the word three. Uh, zero, one, two, three. Correct. So it basically is sending in a number for a card, uh, what's it called? Value, whatever the term is. Okay. And now. Wait, I don't get why the value of the one is the way you just type out words zero and the word one. Well, because there are no zero or one cards. So you don't want those to show up. Oh, okay. Don't you play cards? You're just, you're just causing unnecessary trouble. You don't have to No, I'm teaching Ruby. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, William, yeah, just quiet. Yes. No, no, those are just words. It could have been, it could have been uh, Burke and uh, you know Joe. It doesn't matter. Now, one could argue nobody has yet that I should have had it return an error in this case because it's obviously incorrect to call it zero and one, right? 
So, but I didn't because it was just, well, I just didn't. That's all. <laughs> I can't give you a reason. So we run it. Are you doing two, three, four just because we're dealing with five playing cards and there's no zero and one? Exactly. Zero is a, uh, what is zero? Nothing. And one is ace. Yeah. So I could have put an ace in here also. That's another theory. So I, I run the tests and I see here there's one test. Why is there one test? What in the code here tells you that there's one test? One it. One it. And what do you know? What in the code tells you that there's one assertion? Yes. And what does that little dot tell you? I don't know if you can see it. Yes. Okay. All right. So, William, since you're being very smart today, let's have give me another test to run. What's another test? Yeah. What else? What else? What else could be test? How would I test the suit? You could, you could probably set it the, probably do it the same way that you just did with taking in the uh, array of strings. Okay, but can you dictate some code? Um, and anybody want to ch uh, chime in and help? So first of all, what is the test? What, what do we want to test? Give me a sentence for what I want to test. It will or it does something. It shows a valid suit. Okay. Do. Now, check this out. I do this. I run it. And, uh, oh, I didn't even know this. It creates a valid card. Now it fails. True becomes false. Why? Did I break something? Um, uh, that's very interesting. Expected, got true, got a false. So there's a flaw in my valid. Because if I run it again, it succeeds. Check that out. Whoa, okay, let's go investigate that bug. Who can help me find the bug in my valid? Valid question mark. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, check it out. Uh, call up the code on your screen. That way um, yeah, yeah, I'm not forced to be in these small, tiny letters. What is wrong with that valid? Or maybe there's something wrong with the random, right? Because it's called. Say it's failing on the rank, it's failing on the suit. True, okay. true. Yes? You want to print the card? Uh, sure, absolutely. Let's print the card. So that's very legitimate. Put us at card. Oh, yeah. Duh. I would say I was testing you, but I wasn't. <laughs> okay. Would that show something legitimate? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Oh, it's, yeah, duh, that would help. Okay. Okay, so undefined local variable or method car to English. In, so on line, I'm doing this slowly so everybody can see it and also I can see it. Line 17, uh, this. So when I do a two S, it calls car to English. Okay, that's fine. Um, Car to English. Um, English. There it is. That's one error. That's not it. <laughs> Still have an error. Uh, undefined method plus for nil class in car to English, line 21. So my rank to English is not working. So we're going to look at a rank to English. <laughs> uh, it returned a nil. So I don't have an else. It's usually a good idea. Uh, you could do this. Else, else if, else fail, rather. OK. Pardon me? Yes, but check this out. First of all, it prints nine of club, uh, nine of hearts and six of clubs. It prints it twice. Who can explain that? Prints it twice, even though there's only one line of code. Yes. Yes. Very good. Get it? Okay. Run it again. Boom. Crashes. Okay. We know that it's crashing. Um, 
took the Iran intelligence. Say what? Something wrong with the rank? It failed on line 42 in rank to English. Line 42, well, right here. Oh, it just threw it. Okay. So something's wrong with the rank. So let's, instead of that, put here, put S. Uh, at rank. Run it again. Now, we have made little stars. Hey, one. Uh, it didn't even print anything. Oh, the rank is the string. string. Yeah. What's that? Uh, the one in the string. At rank is one. If rank equals to one, can you see up here? Uh-huh. Oh, oh. Is it supposed to be a string or a number? Ah, no. Nah. Okay. Anyway, I think we get the point. In fact, I'll leave it to an exercise for whoever's ambitious to go debug that and, and let us know on Piazza what the bug was. Okay? So the principle, I mean, this is cool because I wrote this in one sitting. I did a couple of random tests and I stopped. And there I had a, I had a, I had a misspelled method name. It never got called. I had a quoted string which should have been a number. Maybe I put them in by on purpose. It's so long ago, I don't remember. Uh, uh, that would have been clever. Um, anyway, so, you know, I think you all, not all, I think two thirds of you get the concept. And you have to, I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to chase after you in homework to see that you're doing testing. Not exhaustive testing, but that you're doing unit testing. Because you have to get it under your skin. And you'll discover, uh, once you start doing it, especially for things that are a little bit complicated logic wise, that you're going to save a lot of time. Because you're going to have confidence that, that the code you wrote to compute the area, add up areas, count objects, add them, delete them. Can you believe deleting an object off your scene and you, half of you got, uh, had a major bug and you didn't know about it? Can you believe you're, you would be building a huge system to manipulate stars and planets going in orbits and the spacecraft crashes because you deleted the same thing twice? And then how are you going to find out? Well, because you didn't have text. Yes? So I, I feel like even, even though you can come up with the test, it's hard to cover everything. Or yep. Touch every kind of trouble that can happen. This is true. So uh, I found it. Huh? I found it. Ding. Boom. OK. What is it? Uh, RAN 13 returns 0 to 12. Ah. And you want more than 13. So Got you it. Do RAM 13 plus 1. Perfect. Good job. Um, that's true. And uh, don't let that uh, discourage. discourage you because there's the other side, which is testing too much. You know, some people say, and like exa the examples out of the book that you guys all dutifully followed, I think test too much. I mean, I wouldn't test every single validity val validation individually. But, you know, you have to develop a little bit of experience and a little bit of a, of a sort of a, a view in your mind. And you have to have your, 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 you know, your, your ass saved a few times by good tests to sort of start appreciating and find the balance. I mean, the way I usually do it is I just think of the cases I can think of, you know, the edge cases, the edge cases that are plausible versus the ones that are ridiculous. And then I move on. But I keep running the tests. Ah, another principle. Whenever you find a bug, whenever you find a bug, what do you do? What kind of test do you write? You write a test that would have failed because of that bug. Right? So in other words, your system is crashing, you're displaying the wrong number of e-cigarettes, you go down, you find it in, in the code that counts how many things on your on your invoice, there's an off by one error. Before you fix that off by one error, you write a test that exposes that error. And then you fix the error, and then the test passes. This protects against something that we call a regression error. Regression error, we've all had it, is an error that comes back even though you think you fixed it. Very classic. So if I find that, for example, I called this method with a, with a uh, well, take the RAM. If I called the RAM the wrong way, I would add a test. That's an unlikely one. I'm sort of pushing the, the metaphor. But whenever you find a, a bug, ask yourself, can I write a test? which would fail because of this bug. Write the test, see it fail, fix the bug, see it succeed. Now not only have you fixed the bug, but you put in safety net to make sure that bug never comes back. Say what? And if it comes back, you catch it. Yeah, and if it comes back, you catch it. Exactly, yes. So uh, if you're not supposed to test like the every validated something like that for your models, what would you recommend for unit testing on models in your well, the, the vanilla model you get out of Rails doesn't need any testing. Yeah. Okay. So you have to ask yourself what other methods I'm going to ask add to it. Uh, you know, the vanilla. In other words, if if your if your um, Rails model consists of a couple of validations and a couple of has has many, 
It's not in the test. But invariably, you start adding some methods. Now, you, we sort of touch back on the on the, um, on the other principle, which I threw out to you guys, which is that the model should not contain business logic. So models tend to be fairly small. Uh, the classic trap that you'll all experience is that your model that models users, whether it's called user or account or whatever it is, that tends to become the most complicated overloaded just because that's where a lot of the logic that looks like it's in the model belongs, like authentication and validation and stuff like that. So, um, so um, the basic model itself does not need a lot of testing. You, the way, so I'm going to jump a little bit and tell you that what I usually do in testing is I don't test any of that of vanilla model, vanilla control, or vanilla view. I don't test any of that. I test the object, the additional objects that I create to manage the logic that have some control flow in there, you know, something to compute the total or to, you know, um, I mean, I'll show you actually. This, this is, uh, I'll show you some of my tests. It was part of my plan anyway, so let's do it now. Um, done with that. So let's look at some micro. In fact, let me just go right into um, the code that runs this website. Uh, So this is the code that runs this website. Now, um, I'm going to show you a class called CItem, which is, which is uh, totally too long. And this method is totally too long. And it has some tricky logic in it. Right? And I'm going to show you another method, called another class called TOC, Table of Contents, that has some logic in it as well. And very important piece of the Table of Contents method is this prepare the table of contents class is this prepare method which takes an array of items the item I just showed you so in other words this an array of these things okay and it does it builds a table of contents from that okay now let's see how I tested it so I'm gonna go to my spec directory I'm gonna look at the spec sorry the the uh, TOC spec and um, so a couple of things that are interesting that are going on here uh, what am I testing? I, I'm not testing every method. I'm testing, and you can also see the life, lifetime of this thing, because I start with simple sections, and I create an instance of the TOC, and I do a reset, and then I do prepare. Now, if I look at the TOC, I'm not going to try to make you understand this stuff, okay? But there's a reset method there, and there's a prepare method uh, here. And those are the most complicated methods of this thing. Now, so in this case, I picked the things that analyze the dates of the classes, computes when, you know, what, you know, what days are skip days, what days are class days, comes up with the lecture number, all that stuff. And I want to test it because there's some hairy logic there. So notice that the prepare method takes uh, an array of items, and the items themselves are pretty complicated. So you get into an interesting problem, and the problem is now suddenly I have to both be you both be working on a set of items and then feed them into um, into the TOC methods, into the TOC classes prepare method. Okay, follow along because it's a little complicated. I'm not drawing pictures. Maybe I should. Um, so that means that I'm going to be testing essentially two totally separate classes at the same time. And that's kind of a bad practice. The good practice is to try really hard to test one class at a time. How do you do that when two classes are very intertwined with each other? You guys saw that in a much smaller scale in the scene and the point and the line and the triangle where you had two classes and a bug in, for example, rectangle or square, whatever it was called, could actually make it look as if the scene class had a bug but actually it was in the other one. So testing two classes that are complicated together is often trouble. So uh, uh, what what concept that people have come up with is a concept of a mock object. A mock object means a fake object, an object that makes that's made to look like something much more complicated. It's a stand-in. And let me show you and let me show it to you here. So here's a class I called mock item. Notice that I'm just defining it right in my TOC spec.rb. Okay? It's a one-time use class. Okay? 
It has very few lines of code, means I can be pretty comfortable, it does what I want. But the interesting thing about mock item is that it implements certain key methods of the actual item. Okay? So instead of using the actual item and having to initialize it with a whole bunch of data so that I can use it to test this other class called the TOC class, I create a mock version of that. Let me show you what that means. The mock item has a very important method called gen, which is going to return an array of instances of itself. Okay? So it says create a, a, a variable called items and give it initialize it with a, an empty array. Create an array called order and initialize it with a set of numbers that are sort of random. And then iterate across this variable of name. Can you guys read this? Because this is hard. Iterate across names, which is an array of strings. For each one, I'm going to create an instance of the mock item. Forget about this for a second. And append it to this array. So I give it a list of three strings. It iterates over those three strings and creates a new mock item for each one puts it into this array and returns that. Okay? Now this is kind of interesting because I now have this parameter that I need to test the TOC without actually using the real items class. I'm using a mock version of that, a baby version that does very, very little. In fact, it only does what is necessary to test the TOC. Um, uh, William, can you paraphrase what I just said? About uh, the class. Yeah. Well, what is the, what, what is this? What does this line do? Names of each. So it goes through the array of names, and yeah. for each name, uh, it creates a mock item yeah. of that name, or using that name, and then it appends it to the item. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll, there's a link to this code in, in, in the show notes of the same podcast. Um, but basically, now, here I have my, my initializer for this set of tests. And the first thing I do is I call mock item gen. I give it one, two, three, four strings. And now I can use that when I call TOC prepare items. So I've created an array of fake <coughs> items over here. I'm using for the test. What are some advantages of this? Who could say? Who could say? Yeah, I'm doing it this way. You don't have to put it in later or anything. It's just like you're doing Why am I using mock items here instead of the real thing? Oh, because you know that the mock item mm -hmm. has like then you know that the production you know, you're different that are coming out and then you can use them. Who wants to elaborate on that? Yes. No, I I think it has Okay, go ahead. That's fine. Is that with the mock-up items, you can, can only specify to have only the properties that you are testing. Right. So it kind of like cuts off the work if there is more work involved in creating actual items. For example, yes. Uh, so yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, yes. So you also have total control over it. And so, you know, maybe if you're, if the real thing is you're doing stuff with items that are changing, yeah. it works for certain ones, Ones, so right. mock items is always the same ones that you can say, oh, I didn't think about this edge case. Okay, I'll make a mock item that is that edge case. Right. Yeah. So I'm doing two techniques here at once. One of them is the technique of creating an array of initialize, and you guys could all use this technique in your test, an array of initialization parameters and running through it to quickly generate a whole bunch of test objects, the, the, the test uh, uh, fixtures. But the second thing I did was I'm using a mock item. So that's basically what you guys said. So the, the benefit of a mock item is that the code for the mock item is so short. I know exactly what it's doing. And there's not going to be any mystery. I'm not going to be tripped up by some comp, some subtle bug that I have in that actual items class. I'm going to test that actual items class on its own in its own test bed, in its own safe environment. Yes? So, this must have been um, 
It's not that. The difference is between before and that. Context is a nesting. You can think of writing a set of tests as an outliner. And if you want to group a set of test cases, set of bits together, you can put them together in a context. And they can have their own initialization. Let is a, an alternative to using a before block, which creates a variable called, colon, called items uh, with this value. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's I think a, I like this notation better. And you could use it on all the tests that follow. You can use it on all the tests, and a, a, a subtle point is that every test that this does not get executed unless some test uses it. And so if you're this is this is getting like the, this is like a more advanced topic, but if I have a hundred test cases and I'm trying to get one to run, I could run it by itself, right? Which is possible. You can give a parameter and run it by itself. But if your before block initializes thirty things of which only one is needed for this one test case, the, thing, the test is going to run slow. Let avoids that. Let says, I will only actually do this work if some test case needs it. It's slightly more advanced topic. Slightly. Um, so anyway, that's, what, that's what a mock item is. And I got into this when somebody asked, uh, how do you know what to test and what not to test? And really, uh, test something. Just test something. And every time you think of a method that's on, that feels to you like a little bit complicated, Consider writing a test for it. Uh, you can, it's much easier to under, much more likely that you're going to test too little than too much. So just write a test. Even if it has only one thing in it, write a test. Get in the habit. Get comfortable with the syntax. When you have syntax errors, you're going to get strange error messages. You have to get used to that. Very, in this particular format, it's very easy to forget to do. Okay, so you have to, you have to get the hang of it. Um, I suggest you use mini test slash uh, spec, but if you have a reason to use another one, um, yeah, it's actually about uh, syntax. In the when you initialize your uh, mock item, you use an ATT or curly brackets. Tell me what that job is. This the add or act tester? No. No. Well, right well, below the initialize the add. Add and equals curly brackets. Curly braces. Yeah. yeah. What does that mean? Right box section. No. What are we talking about? Line seven. Give me a line number. Line uh, seven. seven. This is just a default. Okay. The default does. Oh. Uh, okay. I thought you were saying add sign. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, you know that. Method you find the second method? Give me that line number. Twelve. <laughs> Give me that line. <laughs> Are you trying to override the, the indexing method in an array? Yes, that's what I just did there. And does that mean that the parameter has to be outside the column? I mean the square brackets? No. No, it just means that it just means that an instance of mock item can be mock item can be treated as an array. So you could take a mock item and do a, a bracket on it, and it will instead call that look up in this add attribute. So the effect of this is that if I have a i equals mock item dot new, I could say i foo. <coughs> okay, and the effect of that will be to look up for the key foo in the attributes cache. Ding ding. George. For what? Uh, no. Um, well, no, it will just do that. To make it legitimate for that, you have to mix in the enumerable uh, module. So you have to do include enumerable. I'll explain to you. The way you wrote it is if you have to put the index outside of the yeah, square. Just, think of this as the method name. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, exactly. that, that's the syntax. That's the way it looks. Means you put it inside. So, so. In, in, in this and that. Okay, just. <laughs> I can't explain it. It's some Japanese guy's idea. He invented language. It's actually very logical. Um, okay. So. That's what I have. No, no, no. Oh, over here. The question. Try to He's not listening to okay. yeah. oh. the offline. Um, uh, so I didn't get to this. Maybe I'll back this to the beginning of the next lecture about how 
PEV works in rails, and I'll do a quick example. Um, so in summary, we did a lot in one class, and we did a lot in one homework. Uh, I'm going to look for you guys to start writing tests in the code you produce. Um, if you have questions about how, you know, whether something should be tested or not, always interesting discussions to have. Um, yeah. Thanks. Fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Thursday. Oh, wait. I'm going to keep you guys for one more minute. So everybody except for one team has signed up for a meeting with me. So that team that hasn't done it yet, please do so. Um, and uh, what we're going to do in that meeting, 45 minutes, is just to talk over the status of your project, talk over what you expect to happen at, on Thursday, and uh, look at your materials. But basically, it's not a check your work conversation. It's a team discussion conversation. OK? Uh, so I have time still tomorrow. Um, and everybody, it's mandatory to have a 45 minute meeting with me. Okay? Thank you very much. See you Thursday. I sent you an answer that said no. And I gave you an alternate time. For tomorrow, you mean? Oh, you did get it. <laughs>